Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope all of you are doing great out there, wherever you are in America, in the Midwest, in the South, in the North, on the coast, in the rural, in a suburb. Thank you for coming out. This is part of our continuing series where we interview professors, reporters, columnists, writers, activists, anybody on the left, anybody on the right, as long as they can form complete thoughts and somehow inform us of the political polarization situation in America, how we got here, how we might get out. And we, our goal is to do this in an unedited, unaltered manner and get the information directly to you so that you could do this thing that was popular when I was in high school called thinking for yourself. Maybe I'll come back. Maybe it won't. With us today, it is our privilege to have Jerry Davis, the professor of management and sociology at the University of Michigan. Aloha. How are you doing, Marcus? How are you doing? How are you doing? Uh, Jerry Davis is the Gilbert and G Ruth Whitaker Professor of Business Administration at the Ross School of Business and Professor of Sociology, the University of Michigan. Davis received his PhD from the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University, very prestigious. His books include Social Movements and Organizational Theory, Organizations and Organizing, Rational, Natural, and Open Systems Perspectives, Managed by the Markets, How Finance Reshaped America, Changing Your Company from the Inside Out, a Guide for Social Entrepreneurs, the Vanishing American Corporation, Navigating the Hazards of a New Economy, and Taming Corporate Power in the 21st Century. He's also the faculty director of the Business Plus Impact and oversees the Plus Impact Studio, co-teaching its award-winning course on designing equitable enterprises for just energy transition. Let's get the page to turn here. Second. Uh, his research is broadly concerned with corporation as a social and economic vehicle. His recent writings examine why corporations have so little insight into their global supply chains and the moral dilemmas this poses. Why the social network of corporate elites has fallen apart. What organizational alternatives exist to the shareholder owned corporation and how national institutions share corporate structures and what this means for income inequality. How platform capitalists might be tamed to meet human needs other than profit and how management research might help achieve the sustainable development goals, how new technologies have enabled worker political activism within the corporation, how social scientists can inform public opinion and how information and communication technologies have enabled entirely new designs for economic organization. That's uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah, we're going to look at some of these things here. But before we get to all these great articles, you can see the professor is very well informed about internet companies, the role of the internet, um, Silicon Valley and how it's going. But before we get into that, let's check in and see how well we did. Professor, did I say anything wrong? Did I get anything incorrect? Did we need to correct anything? Thus far, everything sounds great. Well, you said that Stanford was prestigious. I'm not sure if I'd go along with that, but everything else sounded good. Um, according to the U.S. World Report rankings of universities around the world, I think Stanford and Berkeley came out as the top two in America for the last five to 10 years. So Dang. All right. that. that's, that's pretty good. Okay. I, 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 uh, well, they're decent. It's a decent school. So, you know, I've seen worse. Yeah. I've seen worse. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen worse. Hey, Stanford, go to Stanford. Hey, I've seen worse. <laughs> <laughs> that's their new ad. Just, I could just see that as a banner. I, I've seen worse. Stanford. That's what we do in the Midwest. That's the, that's the thing. Those, those coastal elites here in flyover country, you know, we, we oh, try not to get too big ahead or to show off too much. So. Oh, that's pretty great. I'm going to use that. I've seen worse. Um, well, uh, I'm sure I'm going to get this wrong, but, uh, you betcha. Don't you know? <laughs> yes, that would be more Minnesota, but uh, I'm, uh, we'll, we will accept it also in Michigan. Thank you. Not, not everybody we, knows the difference between those states. We though, don't. But, yeah. we, sorry, in California, it's one mass of descendants of Vikings came and sort of settled. And, you know, we watch TV and it's, don't you know? And I'm <laughs> like... So. And then, then you get to fly over us and look down and say, "Whoa, why, why are all the fields in circles like that?" So, <laughs> <laughs> flyover country, true. But I, I live in flyover country in California, the Central Valley. We have a ah. little bit of the same reaction. Um, so, uh, Professor, what, what is the main thrust of? I guess these articles all have a common theme: authoritarianism with Silicon Valley characteristics. Uh, give me one second to turn the page. The computer's a little slow. Big tech swift reaction to capital rioters reveals a new face of corporate political power. And ran inspired myth of the founder puts tremendous power in the hands of CEOs. Real risk to democracy. 
uh, can Silicon Valley save democracy, risk to democracy, uh, threat to American democracy, authoritarianism? What, what roughly, what's the theme with all of this research and how does it relate to Silicon Valley tech companies and political polarization in America today, as you see it? Across all of these articles, the, the, the underlying theme is that information and communication technologies, so the internet, uh, mobile phones, uh, social media, that this new flavor of technology is really a fundamental shift in how we work together to get things done, like our ability to collaborate or get into conflict or share information, advocate for ideas, that all of those fundamental things that happen in a democracy have been transformed by technology. So that part I just take for granted. That could be a good thing or a bad thing, that it's just that the technology has changed the way we communicate, collaborate, get things done, come to decisions. Uh, the, the claim is that there's something distinctive about Silicon Valley corporations and the way they're run that points this in a more authoritarian direction, that the tools that we've got out there could be used to make the world more democratic, but that's not really the way that it's happening. So imagine that every day you go to work with your smartphone and in the morning at 9.05, the boss says, hey, we're thinking about making the following decision. What do you all think? How about you share your thoughts? Uh, we'll have a little online discussion. And then at 9.15, we'll all take a vote. We could do that tomorrow. The, the technology is there right now to enable us to have much more democratic decision making. But that's not the way that it works. You know, as we see in practice, that technology is used more to centralize control uh, rather than democratize it. So that's kind of the underlying theme. And part of what I try to point out in the article is that there's something about the way Silicon Valley corporations are created and operated that makes them more authoritarian than you might expect. And, and in a way that's more concentrated than we used to see back in the olden days of big business. People used to think about the Fortune 500 being really important for the economy well, now it's really five big tech companies that are potentially more powerful than the Fortune 500 put together. So GAFAM, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, uh, and Apple together, they make up about a quarter of the value of the S&P 500. So if you're planning on retiring, you better hope those five companies do well in their stock returns. But they're incredibly central to the economy in a way that was not true of, say, General Motors or U.S. Steel or AT&T. Um, those five companies had the ability to make decisions that just reverberate to every person in society in a way that wasn't true of, say, a, you know, a GM. Is that what you mean by totalitarianism, that they... They have so much outright unregulated control over the economy and basically all aspects of business. I mean, all businesses have to use the Internet tools they provide to simply survive in today. Um, so I'd say I don't think I use the word totalitarianism. I, I would say authoritarian. Authoritarian. Uh, OK. Yeah. And, okay. and the reason I'd make that distinction is it's it's not like they're running governments. It's not like they're sort of controlling the food supply directly or anything like that. Um, they're authoritarian in the sense that the people that operate, the, the people that lead these companies have an awful lot of power without the tools of accountability um, that, that might exist elsewhere. So a couple of examples there. Mark Zuckerberg controls an absolute majority of the voting rights at Meta, parent of Facebook. Um, so if you read through their IPO prospectus when the company went public in, I believe, 2012, uh, it tells you explicitly, look, if you buy shares in Facebook, just so you know, there's one 28-year-old college dropout that controls an absolute majority of the votes, which means he gets to select who's on the board of directors. Um, he can buy and sell whatever assets he wants. And really, you can't say boo about it. Um, that, to me, is authoritarian. This is a corporation that's incredibly influential around the world, but one person has an incredible level of power within that corporation. Um, there aren't really a lot of tools for accountability. If you're an activist shareholder and say, hey, 
we wish we had more votes. We wish one guy didn't control this company. Um, too bad. You bought the shares and that was the deal going in. One guy really does control this thing with very little outside accountability. You know, even from activist hedge funds or, you know, whatever they might want. It really is uh, control concentrated in one person's hands without a lot of checks and balances from the outside. And arguably, you know, Meta is a pretty important company. There's large swaths of the world where the internet is synonymous with Facebook. They provide, you know, right. access to the, the internet and the tools that you get once, once you do that. Now, no matter how, you know, Mark Zuckerberg might be, have the soul of an angel and have nothing but the best intentions uh, and really want nothing but the best for this world. And that's great. Um, nonetheless, in a democracy, there are tools to hold people to account. There's some way for people to have voice to say, I'm not sure I love the way that this power is being wielded. So that's uh, that's uh, Facebook or Meta. Google or Alphabet, same deal. Sergey and Larry, when the company went public around I don't know, 2003 or so, they said, just so you know, the two of us control an absolute majority of the voting rights for this company. And that means we can do stuff that you don't like. And you're not really going to necessarily have a lot of voice in that. They made it very clear. Buy shares in this company. It'll probably be a good investment. But it doesn't mean you're going to be able to vote us out of power because we control um, who's on the board. Uh, we control a majority of the votes. Um, but as you know, our motto is don't be evil. So I'm sure we'll use this for good and not for evil. Right. Um, side note, in 2017, after they changed the name to Alphabet, they dropped don't be evil from their from their website. So and so th those, um, you know, certainly in those two companies in a very explicit, clear to evaluate way, one or two people has absolute control over corporate decision making. Uh, and their corporations have a level of influence over the operations of our world that are pretty unprecedented. AT&T was pretty important, but there was never a time when you had that level of control in the hands of a small number of people under 40. So <laughs> so that that's the authoritarianism that I'm thinking about, um, is that that is an awful lot of control. And the kind of control that Silicon Valley companies have is really different from General Motors. You know, General Motors was the quintessential giant corporation. Sometime in the mid in mid eighties, nine hundred thousand people worked at General Motors, which is a lot. Um, and it was a company focused on growth, growth in sales, growth in employment. That was sort of the the, the essence of that company. They were important. But they didn't control everyone's access to basic facts in the world <laughs> the way that uh, Google fair search enough. does, right? Fair so, enough. Fair enough. And so th it's almost like the difference between, uh, I don't know, GM is like you know one of your kidneys. It's pretty important, but you could live <laughs> without it. But, 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 you know, Google Alphabet is the nervous system for our economy. <laughs> like they're, they're so important to so many aspects of the way that people gather information, make decisions, um, connect with each other, that it's just a, a you know, a difference in kind rather than uh, uh, in level, I guess. Fair enough. I think there's a couple, maybe some comparisons, obviously they're going to be different. You know, you had Hearst. Uh, who controlled a lot of the newspapers in the 1930s and could just um he literally invented the whole marijuana is going to come and destroy your families <laughs> and uh black people and mexicans like my family are going to come and get you there wasn't much evidence for that and he put that in people's heads so there was at least this time where people could just make stuff up and push it out uh, yellow newspapers i think is what it was called and <laughs> be able to do that we also have the railroad barons and the steel barons in the late 1800s early 1900s um, where they could just tell Congress what it is, you know, and they just would do it. But that wasn't the information control. Um, although Railroad uh, happened to sponsor a president known as uh, Abraham Lincoln, kind of helped him get involved. And uh, I won't go into it, but by the end of his term, they came out a lot richer and with a lot more references, just saying. Uh, but the thing that grabs me is I think people should watch the movie The Social Network. I think it's called um, yeah. with Jesse Eisenberg. If you really want to get a look at Zuckerberg or how other people like him operate, 
Uh, you can take a look at that. There's some evidence that Zuckerberg took the technology that became Facebook from other people. I'm not saying it. The movie's saying it. So it gives you kind of an indication. And then we also have to look at the fact that I remember after the 2016 election and they said Russia hacked the election with the help of Facebook. But there was no punishment and no regulation. There was a Jim Carrey, the famous actor, said, we need to start punishing Facebook. They were in on this. And he got no backing from anybody. And it went away. And then it came out that, like you said, in a lot of countries, the Internet means Facebook. And they found evidence of Facebook providing services to political parties to say, hey, we'll help you win an election. If everybody's on Facebook, we can help you advertise. So there's some evidence of them helping to control and influence elections around the world in an undemocratic manner. I would encourage people to look into that and look into the social network when trying to come to a decision about how good or honest and awesome these people are. Again, I didn't say that. Those are general <laughs> facts out there. Go look for yourself. Uh, I would I would give a little bit of a clarification there. So it was really Cambridge Analytica using data scraped from Facebook rather than Facebook itself that uh, that, that did those things. So it was so Cambridge Analytica was was enabled uh, by Facebook to scrape data that they then, you know, and there's a documentary showing the ways that they've influenced elections around the world. But it wasn't that Facebook is an offer is offering a, you know, we'll swing the election for you service, but others could use the power or the data that that Facebook had collected uh, to engage in that way. So I don't want to, I'm, I'm not, you know, a giant advocate for Facebook, but I, I want to make sure that to, to clarify that bit there. Uh, fair enough. Uh, I don't have the information, but there were a lot of people saying that Facebook knew what was going on, could have done something to stop it, and did not, both with our elections with Russia and with other elections across the world. Again, not me. I'll just refer to reporters like Jeremy Scahill and The Independent uh, and The Intercept. Uh, but that's not really the big issue here. How I wanted to ask you about this article. Corporate America's old boys club is dead, and that's why big business couldn't stop Trump. What, what, what do you mean here, Professor? Yeah, that is uh, one of the most controversial titles that I've uh, that I've managed to get out there, and definitely got me into a lot of fun discussions <laughs> that that that, uh, that never died away. So the the uh, and this article you'll see was published in October 2016, uh, which was before the election. So this was something that we published uh, before the 2016 election, and uh, I like everybody else assumed that it would turn out one way and it turned out a different way than what we anticipated. But we write this saying like, um, we were astounded that that Trump could be the candidate of a major political party, um, given that business did not support him at all. Uh, big business in particular. And so the Wall Street Journal had published an article uh, a few weeks before that uh, that piece that you just mentioned and they had looked up the political contributions of the CEOs of major American corporations. It's public information in the United States. The Federal Elections Committee collects data on all contributions of $200 or more. So if you go online and donate $200 to a candidate, they will ask you your name, your address, your employer, and your occupation. And any one of us could go to opensecrets.org right now and look up every individual and business political contribution uh, for the last several decades. And so if you want to know who is your who is your CEO donating to, you can go online and find out how much money they've given to one candidate or another. Now, what was interesting about this article in the Wall Street Journal is they looked it up and they said, well, in 2012, um, CEOs of American businesses uh, uh, dominantly supported uh, Mitt Romney. And something like two thirds of them had donated to Mitt Romney. And that was, you know, dozens of people, but dozens of American CEOs. What they discovered in 2016 is that not one single CEO of a Fortune 100 company had donated to Donald Trump. And that was pretty unprecedented. It's not that, you know, the numbers had gone down. Literally not a single CEO wanted to be associated with Donald Trump's election. And that's weird. Um, I mean, that's that's interesting in itself that 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 he had no support from big business at all. 
or at least no overt support. But then more interesting was how did he become a candidate for the Republican Party, the number, you know, the the the, the major the, business party in the yeah, U.S. Yeah, the party of business. Like how in the world does someone that business does not like end up being their candidate? And we thought that would be the end of it. And then about two or three weeks after we you know, published this paper, he got elected. It's like, what? How does someone become elected when big business does not support them at all? And that seems very, that was sort of what we were trying to get at in this article was to say, how does that happen? Like we thought that that, you know, business money controlled our elections and that, uh, you know, that the corporate world basically pulled the strings. How in the world did someone that business does not support at all become president? And that was the conundrum that we were trying to answer with this. <laughs> so I don't know. Does that make sense so far? That was sort of the, 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 the surprising fact was, wait a minute, nobody in business supports this guy and he's a candidate. And then, the, you know, the actual president, how did that happen? <laughs> Um, I had heard from another professor that something similar, that corporations used to be very, very involved in both political parties and the Republican party, and they gradually became less involved and then started just having their own lobbying organizations where they go, well, you know, why push for the public? Let's just have a joint business america uh, roundtable group and then we'll have that lobby firm push and so you started to see ceos pull away from direct uh connections to politicians and you fast forward it and corporations are not as involved in the republican party which on the surface sounds great because you're thinking well less corruption right more free democracy but the way this professor argued it was because they had money, because they had influence, because they had a name, there was this ability to go, you're not going to put up someone like Trump. <laughs> no, uh, we uh, donate a third, half of the money or or make it get big or get the ball rolling and have that thing. And they just weren't involved the last couple of years and not really as big a kingmaker in the party. And that allowed for craziness like Trump to boil to the top. What do you think of that theory, Professor? I, I think that makes a ton of sense. Uh, and in fact, this is partly where we end up is the idea that big business just isn't the, the powerhouse that it used to be. Big oh. tech is a powerhouse. You know, the, the companies that I mentioned, GAFAM, they are incredibly influential. But the, the, the traditional big business is the idea that you know, you might imagine getting the CEOs of GE and GM and AT&T into a room together to smoke some cigars and and make some cabinet choices. That's not happening these days. We are not seeing that that uh, that kind of influence. Maybe the CEOs of you know Alphabet and, and Apple might have that impact. But the traditional big businesses, the non-tech big, 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 big businesses just don't have that impact. And I think part of and it's not that. Rich people don't influence politics. They control politics, but it's not businesses per se that are doing it. It's not the CEOs of the Fortune 500. It's often, you know, rogue billionaires that might run a casino like Sheldon Adelson, or it might be, um, you know, the, the Koch brothers, sort of people who are uh, very wealthy. By the way, both of these are non not publicly listed companies. So Koch Industries is not, they don't have shareholders. They've, they've got sort of family ownership. Um, there are people with enough personal wealth to be able to have a kind of impact that we used to imagine big business did. But but th those are very those are very different flavors of people. Idiosyncratic billionaires are not the same thing as the CEOs of you know General Motors or General Electric. Right, like right. they they yeah. have real they might have pretty idiosyncratic views. Um, they, they might love the novels of Ayn Rand and <laughs> who knows what, but, but they, they don't represent the mainstream of business. You know, they, they can have, you know, they might be Elon Musk and, and who knows what he's smoking. I mean, I guess we do know what he, we, he's smoking because we see it on podcasts. So, um, that's, that's a kind of an, a, a level of influence in the hands of a small number of individuals. It's a very different kind of influence than 30 people got together in a room and worked things out, <laughs> It's um it's interesting because they were 
Elon Musk was doing an interview and they were asking about, you know, are you biased? Are you overly conservative? And he goes, let's talk about bias. Mark Zuckerberg donates like $800 million to the Democratic Party and nothing to the Republicans or something like that. And he goes, what do you think that means? Um, like, you know, so I was like, oh, bam, touche. And uh, I was looking up the the Facebook uh, controversy. The movies to watch are The Great Hack. It's on Amazon and the social network also on Amazon. That'll tell you a little bit about Zuckerberg. It'll also tell you about the Cambridge Analytica Facebook involvement. Uh, they lost about 25% of market share for what they did. The American people were very unhappy with them and punished them greatly. They felt that they were partly responsible. I wanted to ask you about a lot of people have focused on social media companies and said social media companies are what is polarizing America. They have these algorithms that are designed to make us angry at each other. And the way to end political polarization in America is to just regulate those companies and make them stop using algorithms that that get us to encourage the same mean things to each other. Does that sound plausible to you, Professor, that that one fix would make Humpty Dumpty come back together again and everything would be okay in America again? Nope. What? <laughs> Shockingly what? enough, there is, sadly and shockingly, there is not one simple fix that, you know, that one weird trick that you can use to, to make us unify again. Um, no, it's, 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 uh, I mean, we've shifted from different flavors of social media. So now, you know, the only people on Facebook are over 65, which I'm not quite uh, there yet. Uh, right. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of different flavors of social media and you can, you can imagine society fractioning into, uh, you know, one flavor might end up on Parler and one might end up on Mastodon and yet another group might end up on Twitter recently renamed X apparently. Um, it's, uh, if, if you're involved in Twitter, you imagine that it's the world, but it's shocking how few actual people ever set foot on Twitter. The kind of people that write columns in newspapers, they might live and die by Twitter, uh, but they are not, you know, the, uh, the, the bulk of Americans. Um, and I'm not, you know, you, you, you can definitely get a feel for polarization if you're on Twitter and you see the way people talk to each other. But normal people are sharing vacation photos on Instagram. They're they're not polarizing because of because of this. So there's different. Um, in some sense, I talked about the break, the, sort of the breakdown of big business as a coherent block or a coherent you know mechanism for political influence. Um, the the sort of uh, sort of evaluation of the so-called mainstream media is also something that feels like that can't be put back together again. It's really hard to imagine that as a society, we decide, okay, let's call a truce and we'll all believe what's on CNN. You know, they're not as right as Fox. They're not as left as MSNBC. They're right in the middle. So let's all agree. Nope, that's not going to happen. Um, it's pretty hard to see regaining a faith in some basic factual information out there. And it's hard to know what what could you possibly do to pull that you know to to shift that like what 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 steps could you possibly take to give to get people to regain their faith in you know this is an unbiased source of information like i, I don't know what you could it's it's hard to imagine a circumstance where that could happen and you and you mentioned um uh, previously Yellow journalism, you know, you mentioned Hearst and publishing biased newspapers like, you know, Hearst caused the Spanish-American War in 1898 with false reports about blowing up ships in Havana Harbor. <laughs> uh, uh, so we've seen it, this before. We have seen this before. we like got to go back a hundred years, yeah. but it was done at some yeah. point. So, so maybe that notion of something other than polarization you know, the notion that we had some unified set of, you know, a handful of newspapers and three major national networks right. that provided right. us unity, you know, maybe that lasted from roughly 1950 to, to 1980 or maybe 1990, but it was not the, you know, the historical norm going back to the founding of the Republic. That was a pretty brief period. Um, 
heard that. that. Yep, that was that was not the case in 1900, and it was not the case in 2000. It was really a you know pretty brief uh, period in the post-war era where technology and maybe unity coming out of World War II made us think we were all on the same team. But, you know, it wasn't like that in the 30s and it wasn't like that in the 20s and it wasn't like that in 1900. So so maybe polarization is our and different epistemologies, different views of factual information. Maybe that's our normal state. I don't know. Now, what, what do you think about that? You've been interviewing smart people, right? Uh, well, I, I've heard that. I've heard that the period from 45 to like 1985 was a unique period and it should it's most Americans view it as the way it's always been. That's a form of presentism. I think, yeah. is, you know, the way we see it now. So, but that that's not true that, you know, if you look at America over, over 200 years, it was a unique time where, like you said, there was cohesion over the war. About 10% of the population was in the war. Everybody was mobilized for it. They came back. They had three television networks, only a few network uh, newspapers, and there was a general cohesion about an identity. Also, you had the threat of the Soviet Union was kind of was a reason to keep. So there was a lot of things going at keeping everybody together that we had disagreements and debates. As I like to say, Ronald Reagan was a partisan, but he would still work with people across the aisle and get things done. He would slam the Democrats and then work with them to get something done. So we had partisanship, but they could get things done. There was, And then it sort of steamed to fall apart roughly in the 90s you had cable news come out and you also had the fall of the cold war and you also had the clinton scandal and it seemed to roughly signalize an end there i've, I've heard that from many people hmm. the question i have though is people say well we we've dealt with tough times before and we survived uh we went through the 1960s and there was the um riots against the German population in the 1920s and the Great Depression in the 1930s. And there was uh, problems in uh, 17, uh, 1890 after the Civil War and obviously the Civil War. And then I think there was something in 1830. My question is, though, they didn't have phones and satellites and 24 hour live television at those times. And I remember thinking of something like, bleeding kansas people go well you know we're not at the civil war era so we've seen tough times and we've survived and i go well let's let's talk about bleeding kansas because bleeding kansas happened for five to ten years before the civil war it basically prepped everybody to participate in the civil war uh and and if they hadn't seen that they might not be willing to start shooting each other if you were to take the size of the american population in 1860 and compare it to now and take the death toll of bleeding Kansas and compare it to now. Roughly what we would see is 24-hour news coverage of, I don't know, 30 to 60,000 people basically tearing each other apart on the streets. Like you would see TV coverage of thousands of people literally shooting each other in the face on the streets, streets running blood red. Uh, and that would be the equivalent amount of the population that had participated in bleeding Kansas or the riots in 1920 or 1930 or 1890. Hmm. And yeah, we got over them. But I'm just saying we lost our mind when 3000 people died on TV. What happens when 1500 die and it's not a foreign terrorist? It's your next door neighbor. Hmm. Um, I don't know if we could survive that. They didn't have TV cameras and phones and intimate journals broadcasting all that hundred percent of the time uh are americans strong enough to watch a year's worth of fellow americans shooting and stabbing and murdering each other in major metropolitan scenes to the point of thousands of people dead and you watch it all on camera because that's what we'd be talking about and mm -hmm. i don't know if psychologically we can handle that so good question i mean think about the death toll from covid which arguably is a million people mm -hmm. um and uh, we seem fine. People seem to have forgotten that it even happened. <laughs> uh, they were not killing each other, and it was not on the streets. Okay. Um, yeah. So level of violence. Yeah, it's a I good mean, question. Because yeah, it would be. It would be. I mean, uh, you know, different from as you said, different from bleeding Can Kansas would be. Everyone is carrying a video studio everywhere they go. So the moment it happens, um, it can be that. That's kind of why I. Um, I emphasize the central role of information and communication technologies as it is just, uh, you know, coffee wakes you up, but meth makes you really jittery, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that, 
that like okay. newspapers and radio are kind of like coffee, <laughs> but, but social media and, and, you know, the, the web today uh, are like meth. I mean, it's like, or it's, it's between like, you know, breeding cattle versus, uh, you know, genetic therapies and going in and altering the DNA. ICTs are like that. It's at a fundamental, you know, almost a cellular level for a society. If you change the way we talk to each other, we share information, we meet up, we evaluate each other, uh, we assess what truth is, that just changes everything. Uh, swatting, uh, where you literally send a SWAT team to someone's house to get them shot because you didn't like how they talked to you on a video game. That's a thing now. What the hell? That's a thing. Just type yeah. in swatting. That's a thing. Oh yeah, no, I'm I'm, I'm familiar. It's uh, it's got a political. Crazy... I mean, deplatforming. You say one wrong thing, or someone doesn't, or interprets something you said as incorrect, you lose all your ability to communicate with everybody. We've seen a couple people, and I'm not endorsing it, but Andrew Tate and uh, the other guy from Infowars, where they. And Kanye West, where they go, I don't like what you're saying. So let's cut off your ability to speak to anybody, participate on the internet at all, or have banking systems. Hmm. Wow. That's the kind of level of cutoff they do in China or in medieval Europe. So we're going there now. Seem, everybody seems to be cool with it. I can't hmm. find anybody saying, no, don't take away their basic privileges of society. That's a you're a bad person. You get cut off and banished. And if you don't have access to banking flows or other services that people depend upon in order to live life tough, you got what's coming to you. Uh, that's what I see. My my question is, how, how do we fix this? How do we calm it down? I've heard people say, well, regulate the social media companies and regulate the cable news companies and maybe they'll do it. And I'm like, well, the thing is, is that from what I've heard from other professors is it sells to have somebody say something sensational or aggressive it sells on social media. It sells on the news. They get more eyeballs, which means they get more advertisers, which means they make more money. They are official corporations. Under American laws, I understand it. Corporations have one duty to increase profits for the shareholders. So they have seen that this is how we make money. How do we get all these companies to stop doing the thing that's brought them record profits? So I have a recent piece with the extremely unsubtle name is shareholder capitalism, a suicide pact. Um, <laughs> you can find it on medium. Um, and I think, um, so just, just a, a bit of a clarification, uh, corporations are not legally required uh, to make profits or to serve shareholders. That's, that's a bit of a, uh, you, you hear that out there in the business world, but it is not what the law says. Um, even though, executives will tell you it's what the law says when they want to be able to get away with stuff. But that's it's not actually a legally binding thing, but it is what we teach in business schools, but it's not. I, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah, let's, let's go over the wall. I just, I've met people who run fortune 500 companies and they've said that. So no, that's the crazy thing is they, they say that and it, but it's not true. Like if, if you consult the law, there's no such obligation. The laws of Delaware, if you're selling the company, you have to get the best price you can, but that's it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's, it, companies have a lot of discretion. Um, why do they ever give to charity? You know, why do they, why do they pay a penny more than they need to? Um, if, if it were, if they were legally bound, they'd, they'd all be in prison today because no one can prove that they're actually maximizing profits. Anyway, that, that, that's a, that would be a side conversation. We could come back on another day for an hour to talk about this. But, sure. Sure. Um, so we admit that, okay, maybe the law doesn't say that, but a lot of people who run the businesses all think it. Okay. Yeah. It turns out that, that if, uh, uh, that it doesn't have to be the law. If the vast majority of your compensation depends on the company's share price performance, you're going to act like it's the law anyway. So it's it's uh, effectively the law. It's, it's effectively the law. Okay. Even and if basically, it's not I'm saying you know if if you don't do this, you'll get a painful electric shock. I'm saying don't. I'm not telling you you shouldn't do this. I'm just saying if you do do this, we'll give you a painful electric shock. Right. It's kind of like that. <laughs> so it's yeah. Hey, uh, we could liquidate your retirement and your corporate bonus, and why don't you just take a two hundred million dollar pay cut? for the good of America. That's right. So why don't you stop uh, providing a platform for, for genocidal hate groups around the world? Uh, you'll lose money, but you know, you'll, you'll sleep better at night. That's, that's kind of the, right. I mean, it, yeah. It, and I don't see any corporations doing that. It's weird. Right? Yeah, it is, it is. It is surprising. Well, in, in this uh, recent, uh, 
piece, Shareholder Capitals of the Suicide Pact, which you can find on Medium, um, it sort of walks through why is it that companies behave that way? Like, why is it that they don't leap up uh, and do the right thing? And what I argue is that we have evolved shareholder capitalism to a level now that if you try to do the right thing, activist hedge funds uh, will swoop in, buy a chunk of your shares uh, and threaten you until you, you know, do the right thing, which is creating more shareholder value. That if you list money, if you list shares on a stock market, you're going to be subject to such pressures that make it very difficult to deviate away from that. I sometimes show an image of um, the harbor off of Toledo in Lake Erie, and it's kind of disgusting. It looks like the world's biggest glass of wheatgrass juice. It's just this gross green <laughs> algae that's got a poisonous, and you really don't want it in your water, but that's what yeah. it looks like off of, of Toledo. And thankfully for you, you're in California. You don't have to put up with any environmental problems at all, but uh, yeah. but the, there you go in Lake Erie. It's kind of a disaster, and you think, well, any fish that you throw into this water is going to end up being totally polluted. It doesn't matter. might have been the healthiest, most moral fish, but you throw it into that environment, it's all over. Similarly, um, about eight certified B corporations went public in 2020 and 2021. So Warby Parker and Coursera and Allbirds uh, and you know several other companies that are certified do-gooder companies. They are certified B corporations. They want to do the right thing. They want to make the world a better place. People, planet, profits. They 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 are all in for this mission. And in this piece, I show how their stock price has done since they went public, and it's from disastrous to nightmarish. You know, some of them have lost more than ninety-five percent of their value since they went public. I said it's not. You know, you cannot, they said, look, you, you don't buy, you don't buy a Hummer because you want good gas mileage and you don't go public in the U S if you want to do the right thing. Um, and so something about the way that we fund companies and as you yourself, you know, said earlier, um, you know, do I want companies to do the right thing if it means my 401k goes down in value? You know, do I want oil companies to transition to green energy if it means I have to work another year before I retire? I'm not so sure. So that's that's the suicide pact aspect of all of this is, you know, I myself have been saving 20% of my salary since 1990 when I got my first grown up job. And it's all invested in the stock market. <laughs> I would like the world to be a better place. Uh, and and yet it might cost me, you know, <laughs> you know, in, in a very tangible way. If the stock market crashes because the oil companies all realize we should be doing the right thing. Um, that's there's, there's a real tension there. Just to be clear, I would like them to do the right thing. But um uh, but it does mean working an extra year or two. So, <laughs> so that that's kind of the pressure that's built into all of this. That's 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 what makes it's not like there's this clear win-win solution that's uh, that's sort of staring us all in the face. It might not be like that. There, there might be some uh, some uh, some tensions there.
Oh, you're still here. I wow. I apologize. Our um, the internet just completely shut down. I don't know why. Uh, huh. It's supposed to work. It uh, no idea. I'm not a techie. It was working fine the last couple of days for whatever reason. It just stopped working right at this minute. This never happened. I apologize. No, no uh, problem. I was thinking it might be the rapture, but it, uh, or the deep state. I don't know. One of, <laughs> <laughs> They're watching your podcast. They don't. Yeah, they don't want to know. Hey, hey, guys. Uh, we mm. love the NSA here. Um, yeah. Well, we'll just we'll just wrap it up. Let me ask you my last two questions, if I may. Yeah. Sure. You're not you. You're not me. You're a third party person who's going to watch this video. And they they learned a lot. Boy, they were shocked by some of the conclusions, but they, wow, that's fascinating. But it's a week later and they're struggling to remember everything that was in the video. And they said, wow, I learned a lot. But they're and I'm struggling to remember it all. But there was this one thing the professor said, and it's five days after I watched that video, and I still can't get that thought out of my head. What is that one thing you want a random person you'll never meet to not be able to stop thinking about five days after they watch this video? Say the political power of big tech companies is different from anything we've seen before from big business. That's to me the, the, the biggest thing is that the nature of their power is just really different. And we need to be, appreciate that, which I don't think we are. I think we're just yeah. looking at it as another big corporation. And you're saying, no, this is a different kind of monster. Yeah, they were the Fortune 500. That was a powerful group. This is five big tech companies have, I think, that same level of power. And we've never seen anything like that before. Scary. Um, and there's reasons to believe that they may not be guided by pure instincts. Um it is conceivable that they have agendas that, that we don't fully appreciate. <laughs> and, and, and Yeah, and they're not guided by better angels at every moment. Maybe they're guided by profit, et cetera. Um, I hope you found this was a fair interview. Yeah. Uh, no, this is great. Super fun. Enjoyed it. I appreciate that. I like having fun interviews where we can laugh a little bit. Um, do you have any recommendations? You don't have to, but we always ask. We like to keep the conversation going. Do you know anybody who might, they could be in academia, they could be an activist, not in academia. Do you know anybody who might be willing to talk about how the hell did we get here as a country with political polarization? I think a topic that would be worth discussing is ESG and the ESG backlash. And so someone with expertise on that, because that, that's taking an issue that seems pretty bland and polarizing it. And the, the, the reason why it matters, so ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. And it's a set of measures that investors use to pick stocks. Right. And, and the origin of the ESG movement was, gee, I don't want my retirement funds to be going into, you know, sin stocks or sectors that I don't agree with, whatever those might look like. So I want to be able to buy a, you know, a retirement fund that's not handing money to tobacco manufacturers, let's say, or, you know, big sugar or whatever it is that you dislike. Uh, and so those measures were fairly neutral. A lot of people wish that they could invest in ways they consider more ethical, but now those metrics have become really politicized and so the states of Texas and Florida will not invest with financial institutions that they see as boycott as using ESG metrics, or in the case of Texas, boycotting fossil fuel companies. Now, BlackRock is the biggest owner of fossil fuel companies in the world, but they also mon uh, market some ESG funds that don't invest quite as much in fossil fuels. Now the state of Texas won't do business with them anymore. So it's weird that something that seemed very neutral has become very politicized. Um, and that seems like it, it's very much aimed at the behavior of businesses. And so um, that that might be a fun topic. I, Viet Hennish, H-E-N-I-S-Z, at uh, the Wharton School might be interested in an interview about that. But um, um I don't know who else is thinking much about that, um, but that's the uh, that so, that might be a way to go in a uh, good direction to go in. I have heard that that seems to be a new front of polarization. Um, I heard, and I don't know, but I had heard that that the debate really got going after uh, with the Bud Light controversy. Um, that they were 
at least the story goes, I don't know if this is true. They did that for ESG and it was bad and it tanked their profit margin. And I yeah, I would. Nice. So I would go back a bit further than that. Um, it was in 2021, an activist hedge fund that's sort of an, an environmental oriented hedge fund ran four dissident directors to serve on the Exxon board. Exxon's been around, you know, they were part of the original Standard Oil Trust at the end of the 19th century. Uh, so they've been around for, I don't know, at least 110 years as a separate company. Uh, the idea that of, of running dissidents, you know, to people to serve on the corporate board that wasn't recommended by managers, that was beyond the pale. It's never happened before that I know wow. of in American business history. Okay. And they won. Three of those people got elected to the Exxon board. That's like, wait a minute. Hippies and communists now get to serve on the Exxon board. Right, That's crazy talk. Right. They're not hippies and communists. Like one had been in the right. Bush administration, but but they weren't the ones that that uh, that that uh, that Exxon wanted. Um, and so I think that triggered and and they, the reason why the the fund that did this, which is called Engine Number One, the reason why they were able to do this is because they gained the support of BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, which are the three largest investors by far in America. And if you can sway them to vote with you, you win. Uh, and that's essentially what happened. And I think that was that was the starting gun for the anti-ESG backlash is people in the business world realizing, holy smokes, um, we don't hold all the cards here. There's some investors out there that might that might vote against us and might get people on our board and our inner sanctum that we didn't approve of. So we got to find some way to turn back this tide. So to me, that's the, that's the real story. They're saying it's anti ESG, but really it's pro fossil fuel and, and anti BlackRock Vanguard and state street. Um, they they want to, they, they want to uh, basically neuter them so that they don't have the kind of influence um, that, that comes with the votes they control. Anyway, that's that 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 would be a um, um, that would be a fun thought. I have my own thoughts about. I might have you. Yeah. Would you ever be willing to come back on? We could talk. Some of more course, about some... great. Yeah, this is great. Fun. I will book you again. Um, we're going to leave it there. I want to say thank you, Professor. Thank you for coming out. Thanks for answering questions. Um, oh, my pleasure, Mark. It's great to talk to you. And I appreciate you being willing to to make statements that perhaps not everybody's willing to hear, but they need to be things we do need to hear. I can't easily be fired because we still have tenure in my state, but not in Texas or Florida. So, you know, there's places where people say the wrong thing on a podcast. They could literally be fired. True. And that's true in 48 other states, especially California and New York. You say the wrong thing and your career is destroyed. You lose all your connections and everything. It's just not a legal process, but it, mm -hmm. cancel culture is very real. I've seen many lives destroyed over that. And then they go, whoops, did we overreact? Well, too late. Yeah, we lost nah. everything. Uh -oh. okay. um, we'll leave it there. I will email you a copy of the video soon. And I want to say thank you, for Professor, for coming out. And I'll have you back on. My pleasure. Take care, Marcus. All right, you too. Bye-bye. <laughs>